the Carrie Still Pitts home. The founder, Carrie Still Logan, was an emancipated slave who moved to Atlanta during Reconstruction. While working as a maid at the Union Railroad Station and encountered many abandoned children, her compassionate heart and her experience as an orphan compelled her to care for them in her very own home. Carrie raised the money to build a larger space and founded what would become the oldest black orphanage in the country, the Carrie Still Pitts Home. Locations have changed, but the commitment to children remains. Her epitaph at Oakland Cemetery reads, the mother of orphans, she hath done what she could. I'm Atlanta City Council member Andrea Boone. The legacy lives. The Atlanta City Council approves legislation amending the city's code of ordinances to clarify alcohol license requirements for reporting food and alcohol sales at annual renewal and update the mandatory penalties for due cause findings of violations. The legislation aims to address nuisance properties and activities that are considered threats to public health and safety and ensure that establishments licensed as restaurants are operating in accordance with license requirements. The council says yes to legislation requiring a minimum of 33 percent of net revenue collected for school zone speed camera enforcement remitted to the city be used towards surveillance cameras and license plate readers citywide, and that a minimum of 33 percent of fund allocations be used toward constructing or improving the city's public safety training facility. The ordinance is companion legislation to a resolution adopted during the council's January 19th meeting to approve an agreement with Atlanta Public Schools for the school bus stop arm camera enforcement program and authorize the collection and sharing of fines resulting from offenses. The council greenlights a resolution expressing support for the strategy of the CDC's public health approach to violence, which is characterized by its emphasis on prevention and its strong conviction that violent behavior and its consequences can be prevented over time, and to express support for the CDC's strategy to build and strengthen partnerships with the public and private sectors and at all levels of government to effectively address the multiple forms of violence. The council approves a resolution requesting that the chief judges of the superior courts of Fulton and DeKalb counties share information with the city of Atlanta on how they've adapted court functions to resume operations with the challenges of COVID-19. For more recently approved legislation, please visit our website, citycouncil.atlantaga.gov. This has been your Atlanta City Council Legislative Minute. Zernona Clayton is a civil rights activist who worked alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Clayton moved to Atlanta in 1965 after taking a job with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. She also traveled with Coretta Scott King during concert tours. She's the first black person to have her own TV show, a corporate executive for Turner Broadcasting for nearly three decades. Clayton is the founder, president, and CEO of the Trumpet Awards Foundation Incorporated and creator and executive producer of the Trumpet Awards show, which honors the accomplishments of black Americans. The city of Atlanta honored Clayton with the dedication of a street and park plaza for a lifetime of contributions to humanity. I'm Atlanta City Council member Jennifer Ide. The legacy lives. We know you and your patients have a lot of questions about the global outbreak of COVID-19, better known as the coronavirus. Atlanta child psychiatrist, Dr. Patrice Harris, was the first black woman elected to serve as president of the American Medical Association. I spoke with her about coronavirus and its impact on our nation. 
are you encouraged by those additional vaccines that may come online? And, and then in particular, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which seems to have far less um, efficacy. Um, how do you convince people who may say, okay, maybe it has a, a better outcome as it relates to death, severe disease or death. However, its percentages is, is much lower than that of the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccination. Um, how do you convince them when we're already running short and it may be the only one available uh, for a time? What, what do you say to those folks who are first and foremost nervous about it, um, especially when you're hearing reports of people having problems after the second immunization or people uh, dying from it? How do you keep that support in favor of the vaccination given these, um, although low incidents still occur, these, these incidences still occur? So let me first start with me. I have received uh, my first dose uh, about three weeks ago, and I'm scheduled for my second dose this week. Uh, so uh, I want to start there uh, to make sure that folks know I do believe in leading by example. Uh, it's the message, but it's also the messenger, but it's also the actions of the messenger. So I have received, uh, again, my first dose and will be receiving my second dose uh, later this week. Yes. Yeah, so after the first dose, my arm was sore and that was it. So my arm was sore about 48 hours, started to get better after that. And that was it. Uh, now, we do know that people do uh, have uh, side effects more often after the second dose where they're, uh, you know, have a little bit of fever, you know, fatigue, don't feel well, like like a flu. Uh, but I can tell you uh, that when you weigh, uh, you know, a couple of days of not feeling well uh, to saving one's life. For me, you know, I look at dying uh, from this disease versus a couple of days of not feeling well. For me, it's an easy uh, decision. Several variants of the virus have been discovered in the United Kingdom, South Africa, and Brazil. Both Pfizer and Moderna say a booster may be necessary, and they're working on one. Dr. Harris says she's encouraged by this. That is good news, that we are identifying early, are able to identify the science and able uh, to be able to develop uh, additional booster shots as they may be needed. We all should be receiving a tetanus booster every 10 years, right? I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, had a tetanus shot years ago, I think when I first came to Atlanta and came to train at Emory and we had to uh, make sure that, that our immunizations were up to date. That's not a foreign concept that we sometimes uh, need a booster shot. As for the mental health of our children, many of whom have been somewhat isolated and they're being educated remotely. Dr. Harris says there's no question that they're still dealing with stress, anxiety and depression. She encourages parents to find ways to break from screen time and take learning outside. She also promotes the idea of families staying connected in a way that maximizes safety. You could say, all right, we, we, I really want to see you, so we're going to not go anywhere for uh, 10 days, and you're not going to go anywhere for 10 days, and then we're going to do stuff and then do that and then go back. So, uh, you know, I, I, I say be creative, but try to stay within the boundaries of what, of what we know decreases uh, risk. The Atlanta Police Department saw a major change in 1948 when it hired its first black police officers. Soon to come along in its ranks in 1950 was Claude Everett Mundy. While responding to a burglary on January 5, 1961, on Parkway Drive, Officer Mundy became the first black officer to be shot and killed in the line of duty. Officer Mundy was 39 years old and left behind a wife and five children. He was recently honored with a proclamation during the 60th commemoration of his death. His family was there celebrating his life and his undeniable bravery. I'm Atlanta City Council member Michael Julian Bond. The legacy lives. Some of these individuals, these young men, 20 years old, facing 77 years, aggravated assault and having a weapon in their hand, and some of these crimes just triple and double 
And these individuals have had to serve time, but they're in a program, a mentoring program like the Next Level Boys Academy that's changing their lives, that shows them there's a better way, and they don't have to do these things anymore, and that they can take life in their own hands by going out there and learning how to cut grass, get a job, and they're better for it. Their wants and their needs are now known. So they don't have to go after things that they want and taking it from someone else. They can go after the things that they need, work hard for it, and keep working to get the things that they want. This is now a wonderful thing. And here at the gathering spot, they gave us the space, the opportunity to do it. And at the end of it, they're even offering some of these young men jobs. And some of the business community needed to hear that because they can also continue to offer these young men jobs. And that's one thing that's going on here. And that's why we wanted to do it to show that there's a pathway out of, out of poverty and there's a pathway out of some of these poor choices that young men make. And right now, we heard from the DA, we heard from the sheriff, and we, and, and we talked about solutions. And we're going to keep doing that discussion as we make policies and plans to improve. I'm grateful for all of the partners that have come in today, once again, to show how much Atlanta is a caring community. You know, we have families that are hurting, that they are trying to take care of housing and food and making sure that all family members have safe winter clothing, clean winter clothing. These are brand new coats, and we want the community to know that they don't have to be without. We have food giveaways, and now we are having a coat giveaway for families in need. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Madeline Archibong. I am the chair of the City Utilities Committee, and today is February 9th. Uh, and with that, I do call this meeting to order. I would ask our analyst, Jared Evans, to please do a roll call of members. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council Member Andrea L. Boone. Council Member Dustin Hillis. Here. Council Member J.P. Matsukite. Here. Council Member Joyce Shepard. Council Member Howard Shook. Aye. And Council Member Cleta Winslow is excused. Uh, quorum is present, Madam Chair. All right, and who was excused? Uh, Council Member Winslow? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you. Would you read the um, message relative to the virtual meeting process? 
This City Utilities Committee is being conducted remotely as advertised and in accordance with OCGA 50-14-1. The meeting will be conducted in conformance with Robert's Rules of Order and the Rules of Council as authorized by the City Code. The public may access the meeting by dialing 877-579-6743, conference ID 831-599-1256, which was noted on the February 5th public meeting notice. The public may also view the meeting on Channel 26, the Council's homepage at citycouncil.atlantaga.gov, the City Council's YouTube channel, uh, or the Council's Facebook and Twitter pages via at ATL Council. All presentations are available on the Atlanta City Council City Utilities Committee presentation page. The agenda was published and made available Friday, February 5th at at atlantacityga.iqm2.com. Additionally, the public was able to submit comments via voicemail at 404-330-6057 between the hours of 4 and 7 p.m. the day before this meeting. These comments will be played during the public comment portion of the meeting. All persons present on the remote council meeting conference bridge are requested to mute your phones and speakers. Additionally, Speakers must be acknowledged by the presiding officer prior to speaking. Each council member is requested to open your Outlook email and minimize the screen. Amendments, substitutes, and informational documents have been distributed to the committee beforehand. Thank you all in advance for your cooperation. All right. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Uh, do we have any uh, walk-in papers? No, Madam Chair, there are no walk-in papers. All right, with that, I will entertain a um, motion for the adoption of the agenda. This will be an electronic vote. So move on. Make... All right, now I'll second that motion. Um, there's no unreadiness. Please open the vote. The vote is open. And the vote is closed. It is six yeas, zero nays. All right, that's unanimous. The agenda has been uh, approved. Next, a motion relative to the approval of the minutes. I'll entertain a motion. Chuck, so move, Matt Sky. Thank you. Uh, the Shook second that? Yes. Not off. Okay, great. Mr. Shook seconds it. All right, if there's no one readiness, please go ahead and open that vote. The vote is open. And the vote is closed. It's six yeas and zero nays. All right, great. Thank you. Um, let's go back to my screen. I lost my screen with the agenda. It's next on the agenda, the city utilities goal. So has everyone had an opportunity to review the goals? Are there any additional uh, goals besides what we've already uh, had distributed among the committee? Have we received any, Mr. Evans? No, Madam Chair, I've received no additional feedback. All right. So we can uh, approve the uh, proposed goals with the understanding that we could, of course, um, amend these if, as we see need in the coming year. So uh, I will entertain a motion relative to our state of committee goals for this year. So move, Matt. Second, Matt. Uh, all right, thank you. It's been moved by Mr. Shook, seconded by Mr. Uh, Mazakai. Um, do we? Is this a vote that we do electronically or just by unanimous consent? Mr. Evans, how do we approach this? This can be uh, on, unanimous, on unanimous consent or a voice vote. Electronic okay. vote required. It is not required? Correct. It's an, it is not required. Okay. Then I will say on unanimous consent, then uh, without any express objections, we now have our State utility goals, and these will be placed on the website for the public to review. Is that correct, Mr. Evans? Yes, Madam Chair. I'll also 
uh, to say that uh, we've been joined by Council Member Shepard and uh, Council Member Brown is on the line. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning I'll to you. Uh, did you say Ms. Boone as well? I yes. didn't catch that, so thank you. Yes, Madam Chair. Ms. Boone. Okay. Yeah, good morning to everybody. Um, just to update the system, is everyone voting electronically? I'm showing everyone logged in electronically onto eBoardroom. Awesome. Very good. All right. And I assume Mr. Brown is here to speak to uh, his paper. Uh, Mr. Brown, did you need to uh, have this go before the presentation, or can you wait through our we have a relatively short agenda except for that presentation from Watershed. I'll, I'll leave it to your discussion, Madam Chair. Uh, it might be interesting to hear from Watershed and then to hear um, your paper. So let's take the um, agenda items in the order presented. So thank you so much for, for that and thank you for joining us. All right, uh, so next we're as a part of our agenda for public comment and we do have some public public comment. So, Mr. Evans, would you please play that comment, those comments? Good morning. My name is Adrian Coleman, and my comments today are in follow-up to the January 12th presentation by People TV's general manager about the state of the uh, public access television station. Had a couple of questions in follow-up to that um, Report. First of all, I wanted to get um, an update in terms of the status of the contract between the City of Atlanta and People TV. Um, has that contract been executed and when does it go into effect? Also, if the contract could be made public um, on the, uh, um, the city's website for public review. My second comment is regarding Ms. Creighton's report that People TV applied and received a $107,000 loan um, from the SBA for COVID economic injury and disaster loan. Um, that's a 30-year loan for an organization that has a one-year contract with the city. And um, I think that that is a uh, concern for all regarding this public board and public institution in terms of how they intend to repay it and do they have the capacity to repay a $107,000 loan. And uh, my question for the committee is how does that impact um, the services that People TV can provide um, to the citizens of the city of Atlanta. Uh, thank you for um, the ability to make public comment today. I appreciate it and hope that you will uh, provide um, a public response to my questions. Thank you very much. Greetings to you, council members and staff, and special greetings to you, citizens and voters of Atlanta who are monitoring what our council members are doing in this 2021 election year. Ben Howard, Senior Advocate, Public Policy Analyst. Regarding People TV, I remind you that unfilled board member slots continue to exist on the People TV Board of Directors because the city's legislative branch and the city's executive branch have chosen to not fully nominate citizens to that board of directors. Each of those vacancies need to be filled immediately with community conscious, grassroots minded citizens who believe in public television and who can help ensure that notices of people TV board meetings get out to the public in accordance with the Georgia Open Meetings Act. This committee can help by seeing to it that notices of meetings of all city boards are posted in the public notices section on the city's website. While well, you're seeing to it that these vacant slots are filled, People TV can once again help producers bring attention to the anti ancillary antics of the NPUR 9 by revitalizing projects like APAP Rundown and like NPU on TV. The public needs to know how and why it is that the NPUR 9 
comprising little more than 1% of 20,000 men, women, and children of NTUR can forestall progress for 20 years. Shame on you, Vice Chair Anthony Robinson, Paulus Clare, Ricardo Jacobs, Renette L. Scott, Alfred White, Allison Hathaway, Sherry Williams, and you, NPUR9 cohorts and neighbors and supporters. That concludes our public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Evans, do we have any updates um, relative to, t to People TV that would be responsive to uh, Ms. Coleman? Apologies, I was muted. Uh, I've been told that the contract has been signed, the purchase order has been assigned, and funds will be dispersed shortly. Uh, there, the SBA loan was reviewed and deemed to be all right by the city. And uh, we, I hope to have the contract in hand for my review and to share with the committee uh, soon. All right, thank you very much for that update. Yes, we do need to continue to monitor that. So please uh, continue to update us as information is coming in from the administration. All right, so uh, next we are at Section 8, Presentation, Updates, and Reports. This is a quarterly update from the Department of Watershed Management. Hey, good morning, Madam Chair and members of Council. Good morning, Nikita Brown and Commissioner. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to update you on DWM's progress during the second quarter of fiscal year 21. Uh, if you have the slide deck in front of you, uh, if you advance the slide number two, uh, this illustrates the current departmental organizational chart. Uh, we'll be looking to post the assistant commissioner position soon uh, to fill that key leadership position. Uh, the next slide lists DWM's proposed 2021 goals and objectives. Uh, we have a total of 10 goals, um, and they include continuing to provide clean, safe drinking water to our rate peers and treat race water to the highest standard. I'll just name a few. I won't rattle off all of them. Uh, we want to continue to foster enhancement to customer service experience. We want to maximize use of most proceeds to address critical stormwater issues and develop a sound long-term plan. We want to continue to ensure compliance with our consent decree and regulatory permits. I want to progress our implementation of priority CIP projects to ensure long-term integrity and resiliency of linear and vertical assets. We want to also institute enhanced metrics to increase responsiveness and productivity. Uh, we're interested in increasing our preventive maintenance for linear and vertical to mitigate reactive response to system issues, such as reducing water loss and sewer overflows. We'd also like to explore unique revenue streams to foster financial resiliency. And we'd like to also foster a service delivery and customer-centric approach to our work. Our new mantra is here to serve. The next slide provides highlights of the department's progress by the numbers relating our core services and functions for the reporting period. Moving on to the next slide, slide five and six. This just really recaps DWS modified oper operational strategies during the current pandemic and response. Uh, again, I did, DWM identified mission essential functions in March of last year and developed a continuity operations plan for each office. The key objective, again, was to, to maintain continuity of operations to meet permit requirements and address emergency maintenance issues during and the event of a shortage of essential staff due to impact for the pandemic. And despite the increase in COVID cases, we're continuing to navigate the pandemic environment, ensuring that we have adequate coverage for shifts across our operations to deliver essential services. Uh, currently, we have roughly 500 to 550 employees that are teleworking, and 993 that have continued as uh, mission critical in a reporting on a daily basis. Through mid-January, DWM has experienced three positive cases amongst our frontline workers, which is roughly 6%. We want to ensure that our workforce has the proper measures to perform essential functions 
in a safe and protective manner. And that continues to be a top priority for the department. Uh, to date, we've conducted over 96,000 non-invasive temperature screenings at 14 locations. On-site testing for essential workers was offered at our water lodge facility during the months of August, September, and October of last year. We are exploring resources available to conduct routine on-site testing at our facilities as an added measure to slow the spread. To date, DWM has extended roughly $1.6 million for the purchase of COVID-related PPE. We are continuing daily touch point cleanings and scheduled deep cleanings at our DWM facilities. Cleanings are conducted within a 24-hour period upon notification of a positive or suspected case. We have also resumed our meetings for technical panel for repair and buffer. Virtually, we did that on October 21st. And the panel is continuing to meet on a routine basis. Uh, meanwhile, our Water Sewer Appeals Board held an administrative meeting in December 2020, which customer here, while customer hearings have, re have resumed, um, they resumed last month uh, in January. Moving on to the next slide, we experienced one significant wet weather event during the period on October 10th, uh, which resulted in 4.53 inches of rainfall within a 24-hour period. Uh, DWM continued to complete prompt post-storm inspection and cleanup for affected areas where flooding occurred. Uh, we've de developed a comprehensive distribution list with ATL 311 and are coordinating with them for emergency on-call phone coverage during and after hours and weekends as needed. Moving on to our administrative and financial update. Uh, the next slide provides an update regarding our personnel status. For the reporting period, we had 1546 active authorized positions, uh, 1404 filled and 207 vacancies. We're continuing our headcount management efforts to better closely manage our hiring approvals and vacancies. The current focus continues to be mission critical positions. We're continuing efforts to recruit talent for mission critical positions via virtual career fairs and related recruitment events, external job postings, et cetera. Moving on to the next slide, it provides a snapshot of our fiscal 21 financials for the period. We're continuing to operate within our target budget. Operationally, we've, have, we've expended about 52% of the allocated budget for personnel and 35% of the allocated budget for non-personnel expenditures. As of December, our actual revenues are roughly 3.8% higher than projected and expenses are within budget. Moving on to our operational, moving on to the next slide, I'd like to provide a summary of the most revenues through December. Uh, you should have received a summary of updated revenues through January, 2021. And as you can see, actual revenues are trending higher than project than projected, which is a positive. Moving on to our operational highlights, the next service slide should provide updates on DWMs for Atlanta metric. Uh, for our Office of Watershed Protection, our SLAs were, as of December, we were at 87.1%. Our Office of Customer, Customer and Billing Services, SLA for December was 100%. And OLEO, our SLA was for December was 89.2%. Moving on to the next slide, uh, which provides an update on OLEO service requests. Uh, as you can see, 47 of service requests, 47% of service requests were related to sewer collection division with 83% resolved. And 53% of service requests were related to water distribution with 81% results. Moving on to compliance, which is 519, we're happy to note that we had zero NPDES violations during the period, which is an accomplishment and is a testament to the hard work and effort of our OWTR team. 521 summarizes the sanitary sewer spill for the reporting period. We had a total of 82 reported recorded six major spills to a period, which were mainly attributed to the October wet weather event and was focused along the Peachtree Creek trunk system. Um, a project is proposed and pending construction that will address rain-induced spills within the vicinity of Adams Drive location, 
We're currently acquiring easements in order to construct a pump station as part of the solution. We're hoping to commence construction uh, the second quarter of this year. Meanwhile, we're continuing to implement revised operation at the RMC, Arm Clayton WRC, and associated remote facilities to address peak flow conditions. Uh, we've also completed additional hydraulic, and hydraulic modeling to identify strategic manholes to seal and or raid along Peachtree Creek that we have observed to be submerged during flood conditions. And we'll address direct inflow and uh, address sewer spills. The next several slides just highlight our capital improvements program. We've got a five-year CIT program currently at $1.06 billion and is comprised of 59 projects. We're continuing to balance capital investments across our operations to ensure completing upgrades to our most critical assets and to ensure the long-term serviceability. The next slide highlights a few notable CIP projects, including our water supply program, Cook Park Capacitor Relief Ponds, our most, fun, most funded stormwater project, our Niles Avenue store improvement, and our North Fort Storage Tank and Pump Station capacity relief project. 531 highlights a few upcoming key initiatives. A uh, few notables we have, a tra we're implementing a trash trap program. Uh, we received a great deal of feedback from citizens regarding the amount of debris that washes down our local creeks and streams and we want to take a proactive approach to doing our part. We'll look to install trash traps and streams in various watersheds throughout the city. Uh, we will look to operate and maintain some trash traps while team with community stakeholders, such as the Riverkeeper, corporate partners, as well as continuing our partnership with Department of uh, Parks and Rec. There are currently six installations. There's one in the Peachtree Creek, Tanya Creek uh, Basin that is uh, operated by the Riverkeeper, and there are five that are placed in Proctor Creek Basin that are maintained through joint partnerships with Department of Parks and Rec and the Riverkeeper. And we're also currently looking to install devices at three additional locations in Peachtree Creek, South River, and Utoy Creek Basin. Another initiative is our flood mitigation studies and coordination with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And we're looking to commit studies to determine long-term solutions to address repeat flooding conditions observed across the city. We actually have a workshop scheduled with them this afternoon, and we'll look to progress discussions concerning potential projects. Another unique initiative that we have is our COVID-19 wastewater sampling, and that is in coordination with Georgia Tech and Emory Universities. Uh, we were approached by representatives from both universities regarding collaboration to explore the sampling of wastewater as an indicator for COVID-19 virus. The universities are interested in assessing our wastewater assets and facilities to conduct sampling. Uh, it's a very unique and relevant project that could potentially provide very useful and predictive data concerning the virus and potential spikes. Another initiative is our water account with outstanding balances review and outreach. Uh, currently we have over 15,000 accounts with balances greater than a thousand. We're looking to mobilize a small internal focus team to proactively contact customers to discuss their balances, address any questions and concerns relating to accounts, and work to get the customers on a payment plan to bring accounts in the positive. In addition to that, we'll be looking towards hearing more about several stimulus dollars that are uh, dedicated to COVID relief um, that may assist our customers. And lastly, we have our wall art mural at various DWM facilities in conjunction with the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. Uh, we've been approached by several local artists who would like to showcase their work using our assets. Uh, the first installation will consist of an installation of a vinyl banner along the fence line of our hemp water treatment facilities by a local artist. Uh, the project title is Glenville, and it tells the history of the area within the Howell Mill and Huff Road corridor. The artwork was showcased in our 72 Marietta Gallery um, from October to December 2019. Subject to your questions, this concludes my quarterly update. I sincerely thank you for your time and attention this morning as always. Yeah. Uh, Derek, can you see if there are any um, speakers? Because I can't see on my computer. I see that there's, pardon me. 
There are two, two three speakers indicated now, beginning with Council Member J.P. Massacre. And who's next after Mr. Massacai? Uh Council Member Hillis, followed by Council Member Shook. All right, uh, members, please follow that order. Thank you very much, Mr. Abbott. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and, and thank you, Commissioner Browning, for your presentation. I appreciate um, that you uh, <clears throat> were able to summarize all the good work that you're doing in, in a very succinct way and providing it to us. So thank you for um, making that um, presentation like that. I, I did have one question around your objectives. You know, the, this committee just approved our goals and objectives, and I would like to ask if you uh, could, Commissioner Browning, to to really be sure that you look at this committee's goals and your goals and um, make sure that those match up. Uh, and if you could share that comparison uh, with this committee, that would be great, just to be sure we're on the same page with that. Absolutely, um, and Matt Sakite, that was uh, my intention, you know, after hearing that you, that you know, we have a set of goals established by the committee. Uh, we will definitely make sure that our, our goals and as well as the committee's goals uh, are in sync and in a line for this current year. All right, I appreciate that. And if you could circulate that to this committee uh, once you do that comparison, that would be very helpful. Um, and final question, you talked about the um, account balances with some outstanding mm -hmm. accounts. Could you talk a little bit more about um, where we are on, um, you know, collecting our outstanding accounts, both mm -hmm. commercial and, and residential. Obviously, mm -hmm. we are in a position of, of COVID and there's some executive mm -hmm. orders, but if you could please right. share that with us, that'd be helpful. So recently, we've, we, you know, we've had a moratorium on shutoffs, and we still do have a moratorium on shutoffs for our residential customers. Uh, we've resumed um, you know, shutoffs for commercial um, and so, you know, we've monitored our, the situation concerning the outstanding balances and accounts over the past, uh, since, you know, the, the beginning of COVID. We thought this was a good time for us to really, you know, despite still being in the current pandemic state, um, to take a proactive approach and reach out to customers. I think we're going to take more or less a tiered approach, uh, with both, you know, residential and commercial accounts. Um, obviously looking to address those accounts with the largest balances first and so forth. Um, but again, we're going to stand up a specialized focus team to um, tackle that effort. We recognize that it's something that we don't want to get too far ahead and away from us. Um, and again, just want to make sure that we're doing all we can to get accounts in the positive and working with both our residential and commercial customers. If they need to get on, on payment plans, working through those um, details to, to assist them in every way that we can. Great. Um, and I wasn't aware that the commercial uh, moratorium on shutoffs had ended. So um, question there, the mayor has, has announced, obviously, a focus on nuisance properties. Have, have, has there been a matchup of... Um, you know, uh, commercial accounts that are on that nuisance property list and their their water bills? We've not done that analysis, CM Mastercard, but we, we certainly can do that. Um, however, with saying that we, we've also, we've had some nuisance accounts that, um, you know, require shut off and it's been mainly because of the reason of waste, water just flowing, which is never good. Um, so we'll, we'll look to do that analysis and see if there's any matchups between um, those nuisance properties and our, our water account. That would be great um, if you could do that. And I'd, I'd love to get the uh, information. Um, if you could break that out by council district and circulate that, that would be very helpful, I'm sure, to, to council members as well as to um, the mayor's task force on uh, nuisance properties. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Appreciate it as always. Yeah, thank you, Sam Massacre. Mr. Hillis? Yes, thank you, Chair and Roger Bond, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Browning, for the uh, presentation and update. Um, first, just wanted to, uh, again, uh, thank you all for addressing the 
the Adams Drive sewer overflow issues. And mm-hmm. glad to see that project is up and coming. Um, and looking forward to that. Um, you know, if at this time, I'm sure I'll receive more details uh, once that's closer to getting started. But do you know if that will require a complete street closure there on Adams? Uh, we're not sure yet. We um, so first we we've got a bypass pump set up, and that's really helped to mitigate the spills um, in the interim. So we're monitoring that that um, those, that equipment you know around the clock. Um, we were looking to we we've talked to a couple of the um, properties within the vicinity of Adams Drive about situating the pump station, and that's going to be. I think the most intrusive portion of the work, um, where we were originally thinking to situate it, we, we couldn't meet um, a common ground with the owner. And so now we've approached a different property owner. So I think it's really going to be dependent upon where we situate the pump station, um, whether we'll, it will require a full road closure or, you know, or lane closure, et cetera. Um, but we'll definitely be able to uh, share more more details with you um, in the community about you know, potential um, impacts to traffic once we get Great. closer to. Look forward to that. And um, also, that just popped in my mind, um, are we still on schedule to reopen Collier Road uh, tomorrow? Yes. yes, we're still on schedule. Um, I'll double check with the team today, but I think we're, we're, we're on schedule to reopen. Okay, yeah, I actually did a, a site visit over the weekend because I got a lot of questions about it and knew there were delays in, in the asphalt. But when I went over there over the weekend, the asphalt was actually done. And, okay. And um, were like only uh, like a few sidewalk repairs were needed, which, you know, wouldn't constitute a full road closure. Uh, so I know people are looking forward to having that uh, vital artery open back up. Yes, we're absolutely looking forward to getting things back to normal within that location for sure. And then uh, my next question, of course, and uh, you may have anticipated this was coming. I know it's sound like a broken record, but I'm still um, uh, those the hydrant uh, yeah. repairs and leaks um, are still very, very, very low when it comes to meeting those uh, metrics. And yeah, was the uh, Looking for an update on those, and in addition to the manholes, because that's also a, a public safety issue. Even they are higher than the hydrants, but uh, still kind of low. Yeah, we've been, you know, we've been, you know, impacted by COVID. We're definitely trying to, you know, shift our resources in order to to keep the work flowing and um, try to keep up with our, our SLAs and. Um, been speaking with our operational group about some measures to try to put in place, and even third-party um, support staff in order to, to get the responses and stuff and to address those issues concerning hydrants. So um, I will we will definitely shoot to have some improved um, metrics for the next quarter and, um, you know, try to make some steady progress in, in that area. Understood. I greatly appreciate that. My uh, last two questions are just uh, issues around hemp hill. Uh, mm-hmm. One, there seems to be constant water, and I don't know if it's like a leak or what it is, but on mm-hmm. North Side Drive, there at the railroad underpass. Um, okay. The offensive pipe, what, what that's related to? I mean, it's been going on for a very long time. We are looking into uh, a leak over at our Hemp Hill um, facility. Uh, we've engaged uh, a third party contractor to, um, we believe there might be a leak on either one of the um, mains are within the tank. And so we've engaged a third party contractor to really hone in and, and confirm, you know, and pinpoint the, the location of the leak. But right now, based on the field reconnaissance that we've done, we think that there's a leak within that, that complex. And so we're working diligently to, to pinpoint it and get it addressed as soon as possible. Understood. And uh now, where are the conversations going about the, that uh, eastern lake dam at Hemp Hill? So the the reservoir number one, or yeah, the one. That one. Yeah, we. Yeah, we're we're going to look to um, advance 
called Capital Project to repair that um, reservoir, that dam. Um, we're doing a little bit of shuffling. We're doing a kind of a refresh on our CIP, but that is a project that we'll look to um, push ahead with. And we're going to determine which um, fiscal cycle it's going to be in. We're going to definitely look to perform the repairs. Okay. And I actually just have one final question. I know uh, you and your team uh, do a lot of hard work. Um, and it's much appreciated. Um, and uh, I see y'all still need some help. Um, were y'all in the process of hiring a, uh, are you in the process of hiring an assistant commissioner? Yes, as I know that we're, um, I actually finished off the, um, the job bulletin and have Committed it to HR, so we'll be getting that that position posted hopefully within the next couple of weeks. It's definitely a key position for our leadership team that I'd like to um, bring someone on board and increase our bench strength uh, as soon as possible. Definitely. Thank you for that, and uh, uh, thank you for the presentation again and, and answering these questions. Thank you, no Madam problem. Chair. Thank you. All right, great, Ms. Uh, Council Member Shook. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I have two uh, safety and security related questions. First, to follow up on Mr. Matsukite, because I want to be sure I get this right. You, neither you nor anyone on your team has been approached by anyone in the administration who's associated with the mayor's edict to, um, you know, tame nuisance properties about checking in to make sure uh, these businesses are in good standing with their water yeah. sewer payments. No. Okay. Well, just an editorial comment. I find that disappointing since I have uh, passed along to the last two COOs and the chief of police that at least one of these businesses, which is a definitional nuisance property, had, I don't know what the status is now, a $20,000 paid water sewer bill. Oh, My okay. So there, so there was one. Uh, I forget the property. Well, we don't need um, to name it here on the yeah. air. But I, I did receive an inquiry about one, yes. Um, and you can let me know if there's any any others. Okay. You know what? If you could let me know your convenience, what, what the status of that, um, that account is, um, okay. I'd appreciate that. And then Absolutely. secondly, uh, in the wake of the um, evident attempt to hack into a Florida town's uh, water supply, evidently with the goal of um, uh, introducing uh, toxic chemicals uh, into it. Uh, what steps uh, have you and your team taken to kind of review the security of our infrastructure? So that was uh, top of the news on yesterday. Certainly, I got several teams about that. Um, actually, forwarded over to um, my information management team as well as our water treatment facilities team for them for their awareness. And we will be pulling together a fact sheet to share about um, our preparedness and what measures were taken to safeguard our facilities um, against cyber attacks. Um, certainly, we've been making investments in our instrumentation of data systems and is also working with uh, our larger uh, aim, to the aim department um, concerning cyber, cyber security as well. So again, we'll be pulling together a fact sheet that really speaks to how we plan to ensure that our, our uh, assets and networks are secure. Uh, we can share that with uh, the committee, certainly. Yeah, good. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's primarily an AIM issue or a watershed issue or both. It's but I think right. yeah. in the wake of that very kind of arresting news, uh, I know we'd all like to, you know, get to the best possible comfort level um, we can have on that. So thank you. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shuck. Um I do know that uh, Councilmember Brown is on the line, and he would like to ask uh, a question. And before he does, Mr. Hillis, are you lined up to speak again, or do I need to? Uh, no, uh, Madam Chair, I'm not. Okay. Uh, Mr. Brown, go right ahead. 
Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioner Browning. I, I want to start by saying, you know, how appreciative I am of you. And I mean, behind the scenes, you've been helping me greatly in our communities with uh, ad addressing some of the struggles that residents are having um, around their water bills. And, and you've been a fierce advocate to finding um, solutions that can truly help their communities move forward. So I just want to say thank you so much for that. Um, I do have a few questions just around uh, some of the vacant positions, uh, just for a point of clarity. Um, are there any barriers for entry to apply for the vacant positions within watershed management? No, there's no barriers. Um, you know, certainly, again, our focus has been to, um, you know, focus on mission critical positions, which are at, you know, varying different skill levels and um, knowledge bases. Um, but no, we don't see any, any, any issues or barriers there. Although, you know, we're dealing with a, you know, competitive market somewhat. Um, but again, we're, we're trying to uh, broaden our, our approach and, and, and umbrella to reach out to a lot of different, um, you know, mechanisms and organizations to try to recruit talented um, uh, yeah, candidates to work with us here in the department. Okay, and, and um, Commissioner, out of the 207 vacant positions, um, how many would you say are entry level positions where they don't necessarily require a specific skill set and um, the residents um, with no experience could potentially apply for them and and either be trained to go to work or or whatever would be necessary I don't have that that you know number offhand but I can certainly um, you know confer with my HR team and can get that number to you okay yeah no that's fine I, I just wanted to you know I, I think um, what's important um, within these committee meetings is just kind of a dissemination of information to the public just so <laughs> if they're unsure at least we can help educate them through this process so i appreciate that um Absolutely. have we looked into have we looked into ways to streamline the employee application process or has it already been streamlined because i know sometimes mm -hmm. um and and this is not necessarily um specific to watershed management but i know in some of the other departments i've gotten a lot of uh, concerns from residents that the ap application process is kind of cumbersome. So, mm -hmm. is, is ha have we evaluated that uh, specific to watershed management? And if if not, is that something you think we should do? Yes, we've we've heard the same concerns. Um, Sam Brown and we here in watershed have worked pretty diligently with uh, DHR to try to streamline the process as much as possible as it relates to our hires. Um, as you may have heard me mention, we have a headcount process that we've instituted internally um, in order to keep, you know, track of hires and vacancies. And um, as you can see from our, our the presentation on one of the slides, we're tracking pretty closely which of uh, which of the candidates are in process, which ones are interviewing or advertised, and um, obviously we have some that are on hold. But um, I think, you know, based on our the strides we've made internal, we're looking to close the gap and try to shorten the, the duration and time for onboarding uh, new hires. Okay, no, that's that's amazing. Um, do we do we currently provide any te technical assistance to um, residents interested in applying? Like, do we have a way to like help them walk through the process, or or maybe the process itself provides some tooling? to help folks apply? Just curious. So not in terms of the watershed, I think I would defer that to DHR and um, their talent acquisition team, um, okay. you know, their process to see if they offer any any uh, support to, to candidates um, who are interested in um, joining the team. Okay, no, that makes okay. sense. And are, are there any virtual direct hiring fairs scheduled for um, watershed management to, I mean, because I know it's pretty difficult through this pandemic to try to 
reach people and, and that kind of thing? I will look into that. Um, I'll confer with my um, my HR team to see what what virtual um, you know hiring events and blitzes we have on the horizon. You can share that information with you. Okay, I would love to host one um, with okay. you, if, okay. it, if, if at all possible, Commissioner. Just because we've we've done it before and it was it was highly successful. It, it was like a direct hire virtual fair. So okay. um, we had the virtual fair and then we broke out into interview sessions in different rooms where you okay. could speak directly to the candidate and interview them. So if that's something you're interested in, love to work with you on that. Okay, we'll definitely look to explore that and, and see how we can um, partner to do that. Okay, and, and right. just two more questions. Um, is there an email address for resumes to be sent to? I hmm. am not aware of a a global email address um but let me let me confer with dhr and see if they have what okay. their status is yeah okay okay and then my last question is um and and i think we talked a little bit about this off off the record but are there any relief efforts for low-income communities and residents that are struggling to pay their water bills or are, are finding themselves in a deficit where they can't pay their water bill. And I know there's a moratorium right now on, mm -hmm. on residential, but outside of the moratorium, do we have any kind of programs that could, you know, either uh, write off some of their, their, their water bills because they don't have the capacity to sustain them or some kind of, um, you know, some kind of offering that would, would help them to address these kinds of issues? So a couple of things, we, you know, of course we have our care and conserve program, which is in place to help our, our aging community with any necessary repairs and leaks, et cetera, to their infrastructure. And so that's always a very good resource for, um, for customers. Um, and again, we, we, we can't write off, you know, we can't uh, just waive the, the, any bills for active accounts. Um, we're able to write off accounts that are not active for a period. Um, but again, if we're, we're looking forward to whatever COVID, COVID relief, some of the monies that may come our way, we're going to see that as an opportunity to help customers that may be having some challenges with paying their water bills. And then, you know, certainly with the, um, the small task force or focus group that we're look, we're going to look to stand up. We're going to look to, Again, be proactive and reach out to those customers, try to understand their circumstances, do whatever types of field reconnaissance we need to make sure that meter, the meter and the equipment is operating correctly, trying to help them understand if they have any leaks on their end, um, and, you know, from there being able to see how we can help in the form of adjustments if, if needed. So, um, That's we're going to be as proactive as we can. That, that's amazing, Commissioner. I think being um, really innovative around the COVID relief funds and how to utilize them and create a potential relief program around those funds to help, you know, some of our most vulnerable residents sustain, I think that that is a incredible opportunity. So kudos to you and your team for even exploring that opportunity. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for everything you're doing for the city of Atlanta. And uh, Madam Chair, I'll yield back to you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I don't see any other uh, committee members in the queue waiting to ask any questions. So I just have uh, a couple and then we uh, will move on. First of all, Commissioner, I, I do thank you for the org chart. It's something that I asked for of um, commissioners for the various departments so that we can connect key people to their responsibilities and teams. So thank you very much for incorporating that into your presentation. Um, you, you mentioned to me that there's a pilot program between the city, your department, and Georgia Tech relative mm -hmm. to, I don't know, fecal matter and some connection to COVID-19. I don't want to be too gross here, but um, is that underway at this point? 
Yeah, so we're working through, um, I think we're, we're polishing off the, the, getting in the last, uh, required documents in order to commence, um, work. We, um, I think we're pending uh, approval of the safety plans as well as the sampling protocols for both institutions. So uh, we're in February. We're going to hope to uh, look toward kicking off efforts probably the, the top of March, getting those um, you know sampling efforts underway. Okay. Uh, I appreciate that. Please keep uh, us updated on that. And I think about that in relationship to our essential city employees who are using our city facilities and mm -hmm. if a lid is a health and safety measure that needs to be implemented right away we need to do that mm -hmm. and i know Absolutely. at 72 marietta street marietta street you told me that they have installed lids on toilets there but i wonder if we need to do that across all city departments where at this level, we have essential workers, and later on, we'll have a uh, full complement of city employees back online. I'm, I'm just very, very concerned about that dynamic of this virus. Understood. So is that a watershed or, or a DEEM issue, or is that something you would look into, or how does that work? Um, I'll look into it to see what you know, precipitated the installations of uh, the lids here at, at uh, 72 Marietta. Um, I want to, you know, likely was a deem initiated um, initiative, but I can confirm that. Okay. All right. Uh, and do your workers that are essential and um, I guess at highest risk of contracting COVID, are they issued N95 masks or just the three ply disposable masks that we see? All around town. So yes, yeah, so our workers who are working in the the sanitary sewer wastewater environment, they mm -hmm. are issued N95 masks. However, our workers who are, who are dealing with the potable water water distribution, they're um, offered the three ply um, masks. Okay. All right. Great. Well, I know that safety of our employees is uh, key, and so uh, thank you very much for those efforts. So, uh, thank you for responding to all of the questions that were posed by colleagues. I think they were very um, interesting, and we look forward to the next update. Uh, no, thank so, you for having me again. No, yes, thank you for a very comprehensive uh, update. So, we don't have any other speakers, so we will now move, uh, move excuse me, to the part of our agenda for ordinances for first read, Mr. Evans. Item number one, 2100102, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee amending the FY 2021 Water and Wastewater Re Revenue Fund budget by adding to anticipations and appropriations the amount of $564,478.00 for the purpose of funding the Department of Public Works to perform street sweeping services in accordance with a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Watershed Management and the Department of Public Works and for other purposes. Item number two, 210103. An ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor or her designee to apply for and accept a Federal Emergency Management Administration Mitigation Assistance Program grant on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management as subgrantee to Georgia Emergency Management Agency in an amount not to exceed $750,000.00 for the acquisition of a residential structure with severe repetitive losses due to flooding events in the area of Peachtree Creek and for other purposes. Item number three, 2100104, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2021 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget in the amount of $11 million and zero cents to transfer funds from Watershed Reserve for appropriations and add funds to the Water Distribution System Improvements Project and for other purposes. And that concludes the first read items. I said, uh, thank you for reading that. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so by virtue of having read those items, they're accepted by the committee and they will come back to us at our next 
scheduled meeting. So now moving on to the regular agenda. Item for second reading, Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans? Apologies, I was uh, muted. Um, item number four, 21R31. A resolution by Council Member Antonio Brown to request that the Chief Financial Officer conduct a study to determine the feasibility of creating a new water bottling and distribution municipal enterprise that will generate revenue for the city without placing further strain on the city tax base while creating a workforce development program to create middle wage jobs and for other purposes. Uh, Mr. Brown, did you want to uh, speak to this paper? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not sure. Should we bring the substitute forward now, or or should we, or should I speak on it and and then we bring the substitute forward? Did the substitute? Uh, good point, uh, Mr. Evans. Did the substitute change the caption in any way? The substitute does not change the caption. All right. I'll make the motion to bring the substitute forward. Shook. Thank you, Mr. Shook. If there's no one readiness, please open the vote on bringing the substitute forward, and it is in our packet. The vote is open. Oh, my computer froze, so mark me in the affirmative, please. Noted. Uh, the vote is closed. It is six yeas and zero nays. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. The substitute is now before the committee. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, colleagues, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to speak to this paper. Um, just to kind of uh, give a, um, a, some background information on how this resolution came to be. Uh, before Commissioner Powell uh, left the organization, um, we were discussing ways within watershed management um, in which we could generate revenue uh, without putting further strain on the city's tax base while creating a comprehensive workforce development program. And, you know, as, as many of you know, we've struggled in this city with addressing um, what what has been slated as the water boys in which, you know, you have these young boys on the corner selling water in which many of them are struggling uh, to survive in their communities that in which they come from broken homes and and, you know, are 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 using this opportunity to sell water on the corners um, to be able to put food on their tables and you know, I, I was one of those water boys growing up in poverty, um, except I wasn't selling water, I was selling candy on the corner. So I, I recognize the, the struggles that they face every day in these streets. And I, I also recognize the burden that this is placed on residents because there's been a ton of, of, of unfortunate circumstances that have resulted in crime and deaths and other things in this city with regards to the water boys. And I believe if we, if we had an opportunity in place to put these young men to work, that they would take full advantage of it. And, and I, I do believe in my heart it would deter this issue. Um, so through this process, we discuss the possibilities or the potential feasibility of establishing a water bottling and distribution company um, in which we could bottle the city's water and and enter into the retail market, whether it is as a nonprofit or as a for, for-profit enterprise. Either way, the purpose of this was to generate additional revenue um, into the city because I don't believe at this point we can continue to solely rely on the city tax base to sustain a lot of what this city needs to move forward, whether there's systemic issues 
are new issues that have arisen through through you know time um, within our city. And we saw this opportunity as one that could accomplish that. I do um, want to to say that we're not sure if this can work. Um, the law department has reviewed the resolution to ensure it's sound in what it's seeking to do, but the law department would still need to review the um, feasibility from a legal framework side of how something like this could happen alongside watershed management and the other entities that would engage in this conversation. Um, after speaking with Chairwoman Archibong on, on the paper, we decided that the best course of action to proceed in, in moving this, this study forward to determine the feasibility was that uh, we would put together a, a working group. And this working group um, would consist of, of the chairwoman um, from city utilities, the uh, chairwoman from the finance exec committee, the chairman from the community development human services committee, and myself as the lead author of this paper, and really explore um, nine critical items within this study. One, a market analysis. Two, identify potential bottling distributors. Three, analysis, an analysis of a viable legal framework and requirements such as insurance under which such a municipal enterprise may be established within the state of Georgia and the city of Atlanta. Uh, a financial analysis that estimates initial and ongoing costs of such a municipal enterprise, as well as the potential for revenue generation and job creation. And evaluate engaging in interdepartmental agreements to identify funding sources to establish a municipal, municipal enterprise. Evaluate creating a pathway that will protect watershed management's bond covenants through establishing the enterprise as a customer to direct payment for usage of the city's water, establishing a public good through uh, this enterprise that will create middle wage jobs in low income communities and reinvestment fund to advance city needs. Evaluate if the community development block grant fund can be utilized to support such an enterprise and or the programmatic initiatives. And then finally, evaluate the feasibility of a pilot enterprise. So colleagues, this is pretty much the basis of the resolution. Um, I would appreciate your support on this. Um, uh, Council Member Archibong is a co-sponsor on the legislation alongside me. I would love to have other council members um, be a part of sponsoring this legislation as well. I think it's it's an incredible opportunity to explore um, and, and look at innovative ways um, to address the needs within the city of Atlanta. Madam Chair, I'll yield back to you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I was taking notes and I came up with 11 uh, study areas, but mine is good too. Um, I cannot see, uh, uh, Ms. Evans, I cannot see the screen. My computer is frozen. So do we have any uh, colleagues lined up to speak? Councilmember Massacite would like to speak. Great. Uh, please do so. Mr. Massacite. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I may have missed this, but how much um, do we estimate that this study would cost? Mm. So, Mr. Mazikai, um we're looking at a, a way to do this study where there's no outside burden on the city of like a consulting firm coming in. We, we created a, a work group that would work with watershed management, um, the CFO, um, Invest Atlanta, and um, our law department in determining the feasibility of what it would take to stand up this enterprise. You know, the, cities, the city has stood up several enterprises in the past of course, including watershed management. So we, we have the, the wherewithal to do it. And, and I think it's really just looking at all the components of it to see if it will work or if it will not work. 
Gotcha. Okay, so so it's funded from the outside, much like some of our other um, um, consulting resources that come in. I'm assuming we would, you know, accept their their gift through this process. Is that how it would work? Um, so so we we haven't identified that yet within the study because I think um, council member what we're what we're trying to do is do this study in house with our current departments and and determine the feasibility of it as we begin to figure out what it would take to move it forward so i set the um the time frame at 120 days um to give the city the capacity to do their analysis and then kind of proceed from there after they do their analysis before bringing on a consulting firm and potentially uh, you know, uh, occurring any additional expenses to determine the feasibility of this. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's all I had. Yep. All right. Mr. Evans, is anyone else in the speaker's queue? I don't see anyone who else who wishes to speak. Just let us approve. All right. And I'd like to second that. And if there's no one readiness, uh, please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas and zero nays. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Brown, for bringing this uh, very, very interesting uh, idea and proposal to the city and look forward to um, the next step. So thank you very much. This now, as you know, moves to full council. This this was not a dual referral. Is that correct? <clears throat> I apologize. Yes, the, the, uh, the committee should refer this to the finance and executive. Committee. Ah, okay. So the next step would, would be to refer it to finance exec. Now, is that automatically done or do we need to vote? No, that would be a vote of this committee. All right. Uh, so I move that we refer this paper to finance exec. Need a second. I don't know who that was. Okay. Then, did one you one. hear who the second was? I have uh, Council Member Shook as a seconder. Okay. All right. I think we're ready to open the vote. The vote is open. I'm still locked out, so please indicate affirmative for me. Yes, ma'am. It is six yeas and zero nays. This item is referred. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you very much. All right, our next item, please. Item number five, 21R3154, a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor or her designee to enter into a contractual agreement with Republic Services of Georgia, LP, and Genesis Testing Services, Inc., DBA 3G and L joint venture for the for RFPS 1200455 municipal solid waste on behalf of the Department of Public Works for an initial term of three years and two additional one year renewal options to be exercised at the sole discretion of the city based on a processing rate of $39.75 per ton in an amount not to exceed $4,500,000, all contracted work to be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Uh, there is a substitute in the packet I should have mentioned, and it will change the caption. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wondered why you were reading it when you knew that. So I guess we have to now do a motion to bring the substitute forward, which I'll make. Second. Second. Sure. Okay, Mr. Shook has seconded that, so let's vote on uh, bringing the substitute forward, and I guess you'll have to reread this, I guess. That's correct. Hmm. The vote is open. And the vote is closed. It's six yeas and zero nays. The uh, caption reads as follows. 
a substitute resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor or her designee to enter into a contractual agreement for RFPS 1200455 annual contract for municipal solid waste with Republic Services of Georgia Limited Partnership and Genesis Testing Services, Inc., DBA, 3 gnl joint venture on behalf of the Department of Public Works Office of Solid Waste Services for an initial term of three years with two one-year renewal term options based on a processing rate of $39.75 per ton and an amount not to exceed $4,500,000 in zero cents annually. All contracts will work to be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed and for other purposes. All right, thank you. I understand uh, Carla Lipscomb is on the, is on the line. From Department of Public. Good morning. This is Carla Lipscomb, Department of Public Works. Um, this legislation was submitted to award solid waste disposal to Republic Services. Um, this contract is for three initial years with two one-year renewals. Uh, we negotiated a rate of $39.75. Uh, we we're currently paying $41 a ton and the annual amount spent per year will be approximately $4.5 million. All right, thank you uh, very much. Mr. Evans, I can't see the computer screen. Is the, um, are, are there any speakers? In the I, do not, I do not see any speakers who have indicated the wish to speak. All right, Holly, what is your uh, oh. desire? I, I'm sorry, I do see Council Member Shook wishes to speak. Please do so, Mr. Shook. Well, as soon as I unmute myself, I will. Um, <laughs> so, I'm a little curious. Uh, there were two respondents. One, who's done business with us for years, uh, was deemed unresponsive. I'd like to hear uh, a little bit more about that. Okay, um, there were two submittals, and to my knowledge from procurement, there was one that was named non-responsive, and I believe that Joyce Webb is on the line and she can give you more details. I think we have um, the Chief Procurement Officer, uh, Mr. Clark. Okay. Mr. Clark, are you on the line? Good afternoon. Uh, actually, good morning. This is Chief Procurement uh, Martin uh, Officer Martin Clark. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Actually, I'm trying to pull up that, uh, that file to confirm uh, the reason uh, why they were found non-responsive. Uh, if you would give me a moment. Uh, um, good morning. This is George from the Department of Procurement. Um, we've, we received, I, uh, uh, what is your name? Sorry, Joyce with the Department of Procurement. All right, go ahead, please. Joyce, your last name? Webb. Joyce Webb. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. If Mr. Clark is not going to be talking. Okay, so I'm on to, um, Council Member Sue. We received uh, two responses to solicitation. The other response that came from waste management, they did not meet, they were not responsive because they did not meet uh, to adventure requirements of the solicitation. They did not meet the what? You're uh, kind of breaking up a little bit. Waste management the did not what? The right. joint venture requirements. 
Okay, Mr. Clark, your reception, I can hear you a little bit better. Could Mr. Clark um, yes. pick it up for Good me? Good morning. Uh, yes, good morning. Yes, unfortunately, on this uh, submission, waste management did not meet the uh, good faith requirements to submit a joint venture, and as a consequence, uh, were found non-responsive. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Schiff. Well, no, I'm sorry. All right, that's interesting. Again, they've been business with us forever. They know the drill, and so I don't know if that was an omission or a business decision or what. Now, Mr. Clark, you're going to have to, to catch me up here in situations where a bidder does not uh, to go with a partner. A city, I believe, and I don't know who the deciders are here, uh, can, can still look at them uh, along with whoever else is, is in the mix. Uh, am, I, am I right on that? And, and how, how, would, how would Republic's bid have fared against them but for the lack of a minority partner? Right here at, at, the, at the city of Atlanta, uh, Councilman Shook, uh, we of course have a very, very robust uh, equal business opportunity program that includes a uh, component that requests that bidders uh, use good faith efforts to provide a joint venture. In this particular case, they did not submit any. Uh, as a consequence, uh, they uh, were not uh, considered or their bid was not considered. Um, it, as far as a comparison of the two, I'll, I'll have to defer to uh, Joyce uh, Webb from my uh, my contract manager on that file to provide that info. Um, but generally, uh, we enforce uh, these uh, good faith requirements. Um, I am not so sure why. I do not know why they did not submit it. Uh, they have done business with us in the past. They are aware of our um, our contract requirements and uh, for some reason failed to meet those requirements. Uh, as a consequence, we moved on to the next um, uh, to and found uh, Republic responsive and consequently gave them the contract. No, I, and I appreciate that, and, and I'm aware of and supportive of some of our policies as goals. Uh, I'm not sure they're sac sacrosanct, considering it's the public that you know pays the difference. And so I am interested in finding out the answer. And, and there may not be a difference. Uh, Republic may have offered the better deal, irrespective of who other bidders wanted to team up with or not. I would like to know that, and then also. Given some of the um, sort of buyer's remorse we've had previously when um, legislation comes to committee uh, where we need to ratify a vendor's um, you know, fee increase or charge increase, uh, tell us, if you would, um, what kind of protections for rate payers are in this contract or would uh, the winning um, the vendor, to what extent would, would the winning vendor be able to um, hike prices uh, at their own request? Uh, in terms of escalations, uh, I am not familiar whether or not we're uh, allowing that. Joyce, can you confirm that? Hi, Martin. I don't believe this contract allows for escalation. So in this case, uh, Councilman Schick, uh, hopefully that will not be a, a concern, sir. All right. Yeah, hopefully is the word I don't try to hang heavy objects on right here. <laughs> so so I'm going to wait, uh, Madam Chair, until I get a kind of a clear answer to uh, both of my questions. Thank you. So does that mean that's a motion or what, what are you saying? Well, 
I mean, if a motion is made to uh, approve this, I, I will abstain and endeavor to get the answers to my two questions. That's all. All right. Thank you, Mr. Schiff, for that clarification. I think I will see Mr. Mazakite in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question is, the the current rate of this contract is thirty nine seventy five per ton. What was the um, processing rate of the prior contract? This is Carla Lipscomb. The prior contract with waste management, we were paying forty one dollars per ton. Thank you very much. All right, any other questions? And Mr. Um, Clark, the information that Mr. Shook is seeking, that's something that you can provide within what time frame? Uh, we will absolutely have that hopefully within the, the, uh, the next half hour. Okay. Uh, colleagues, any other questions? Now, if we don't, if we were to the lay passage if we were to say hold it in the committee um where are we now with is there a contract that's expiring are we on a 90 extension remind me where are we i apologize uh, uh chairwoman are you asking the, the department of procurement I'm asking whoever has the answer. We've got a bunch of folks on, line, on the line. Um, the current, the contract was last extended for two months. 5035 was last extended for two months. So we're on that two month extension. Where are we in that two month extension? It is slated to expire at the end of this month. Okay. All right. That's the information that I needed. Okay. Um, colleagues. I'll entertain a motion. What is your desire? Well, if we have time to uh, sustain, you know, one more hold in order to get the answers to these questions, um, you know, if that, then I'll go ahead and make that motion. Uh, I mean, I like the fact that the price is down two bucks, but if they can take it from, you know, 39 about 44 in 60 days, that's not going to mean much to you. But I'll listen to the wishes of others. So you're formally making a motion to hold? Uh, yes, based on what we've been told, which is uh, we can sustain that, yes. All right, we have a motion before us to hold. Is there a second? Second, Hillis. No, I did not find Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or unreadiness? I don't see anyone. So uh, let's go ahead and open that vote. The vote is open. I'm, um, let's see. I've gotten a, a text from, from someone in the department saying that they need it passed and wanted to know if we would do it on condition, but we're in the middle of a vote, so let's carry uh, this vote first. And I would vote um, no. Movers and seconders have the ability to vote no as well. <laughs> Are you the parliamentarian? That's good. And I can't see the vote if it's closed or not. I can't see it. It's not yet closed. Is that, have all members voted? Okay. The motion is not carried. It's three yeas, three noes. Okay. I'll make a, a motion to move this forward on condition that we receive the information requested by uh, Council Member Shook, I close the business today. Okay. So that's 5 p.m. I'll second that, Mr. Cook. Thank you. Yeah. That's fine. Shook with a question, though. 
Yes, sir. Go ahead. Well, I'm just kind of curious. We, we were told, the committee was told we had time to sustain a delay, and then we were told we didn't. So just an editorial comment that does not uh, do a lot for my – that's kind of one more step back on this for me. Thank you. Well, I think we heard from um, the procurement office, or did we hear from Ms. Lipscomb on the whether or not this is time critical? Who was speaking? Who went? Um, this is Joyce Webb. I, I'm the one that said that the contract expires at the end of this month. So we have to and have you the are new one in. Or, sorry, procurement. What? You're with procurement. We'd like to hear from the department, but thank you very much, Ms. Webb. May we hear from someone in the public works department, please, who can speak to the issues at hand? Yes, good morning. This is Rita Braswell at the Department of Public Work. Although the contract ends, it expires for 28th. Um, passing the legislation in this cycle allows time for the contract to be routed to the vendor. Right. So in other words, I mean, go ahead, Mr. Schiff. Well, I'm just going to say, so that's not, we now have a yes and no and a mate. <laughs> what, I, what I heard, not to debate it, but what I uh, think I heard was Ms. Webb gave a technical answer, and now from the department, we are getting more of the um, time challenges that the department may face and getting from uh, us holding this and then having the scramble, I guess, would maybe not be a technical word, but it would be more difficult if we now hold this one more cycle versus it typically what takes several weeks to get the signatures. Yes, it takes like several weeks for the signatures and um, the insurance to be attached. Okay. So I don't think we had inconsistent information. I think we just got more information is, is <laughs> what I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. So, uh, colleagues, we have uh, a motion before us to move, to approve, and the condition is to have the information requested by council membership shook by uh, the close of business today, which we understood from um, Mr. Clark could be provided in about 30 minutes. So that is the motion before us. Are there any other questions? Madam Chair, could you repeat the mover and seconder for me? Uh, I moved in, I believe, Mr. Hillis, but I may be wrong. Mazakite. Ah, Mr. Mazakite, I apologize. Thank you. All right, colleagues, any other unreadiness? The vote is open. Thank you, sir. And the vote is closed at six yeas and zero nays. All right. Thank you uh, very much for that. And that moves on. And Mr. Clark, uh, please email that information to all of the uh, members of the committee, please. Will do. Will do. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Evans, uh, go to our last item. Item number six, 21R3155, a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing additional funding for the project number listed, State Route 14 from Coweta County line to State Route 92-138 in Fulton County, Georgia, with Georgia Department of Transportation on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management for the adjustment relocation of facilities as part of the project in an amount not to exceed $89,550.00. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account numbers listed and for other purposes. All right, Mr. Bocaro, good morning. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Council Members. Uh, this is Rob Bacara, Department of Watershed Management. Uh, on July the 6th, 2020, Council adopted legislation 20R4071 for Georgia DOT projects 
a PI number M005988 in the amount not to exceed $99,900. A Georgia DOT uh, opened the bidding for this project on September the 18th, 2020. The winning bids appraised DWM's utility adjustment costs at $189,550, exceeding uh, Watershed's estimate by $89,550. Therefore, this legislation is requesting the balance of the funding. Uh, as a reminder of the purpose of the Georgia DOT project, it's to provide milling and resurfacing long state route um, 14 from Coweta County line to state route 92 138. Watershed management has various water related facilities, which include water valve boxes, water meters, and um, and boxes, water mains, fire hydrants, and other facilities located within the property limits. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, Mr. Bacaro, what accounts for the gap between what our department estimated and what happened with the winning bidder in their estimate of the cost for this project? Yes, thank you. Um, whenever we submit uh, legislation to uh, for GDOT type projects, uh, our engineers and uh, consultants prepare an estimate for the relocation. Um, um, most of the time, our estimate comes in at less than the, the final bid, but occasionally uh, the, the cost of the winning, the, the winning contract uh, ends up costing more than originally an, anticipated. But this is a pretty rare occurrence, so the, the, this is just one of those instances where the cost of doing the work was uh, um, underestimated by our, our estimators. Okay. And so then you have an opportunity then to review your work and to compare and say, okay, this does make sense. And so the recommendation at this point, having done that due diligence, is to, you know, approve this. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. All right, colleagues, I can't see the queue. Is anyone in the queue with any other questions? I'll move approval. Sure. All I'll right. What the queue, Madam Chair? All right, great. Uh, I'll second that. And if there's no one readiness, uh, please go ahead and open the vote. The vote is open. And the vote is closed at six shades and zero nays. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Evans, that stands approved. Do we have any items being removed from hell today? Uh, no, Madam Chair, no items being removed from hell today. All right, thank you very much. Now, I've received a request from um, Public Works to give uh, an update to the committee and also for uh, public dissemination, some information. So, um, Mr. Robinson, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I'm on this footstep. All right. Good morning, Madam Chair and Council Members. This is Interim Deputy Commissioner Steve Robinson with the Department of Public Works. Uh, we'd like to announce a service change. In this unprecedented and challenging time, the City of Atlanta Department of Public Works Office of Solid Waste Services continues to provide essential sanitation and environmental services throughout the city. As COVID-19 cases continue to rise nationally and locally, the virus has directly impacted our solid waste frontline workers. Solid waste services needs a minimum of 75% attendance rate to provide daily services to residents. The department has not seen a 75% attendance rate since January 20th, 2021. The department identified if it reached three consecutive days of an attendance rate of 69% or below, it would implement an emergency plan. At the same time last week, the department's attendance rate was 69%. Friday and Monday saw an increase in sick call-outs. Yesterday, the attendance rate dropped to 60%. The faster than expected decline is due to the increased number of COVID-19 cases. As a result, the Department of Public Works must implement service changes to help mitigate the adverse health and risk safety effects to its employees. 
while continuing to provide quality, effective, and efficient services to our residents. I'd like to highlight what the department is working on. Hiring and recruitment. The DPW Human Resource Department has had ongoing recruiting and promotion of open positions and hiring blitzes for several months. Our efforts have seen quite a bit of success. However, the pacing of the onboarding process has not been able to support the loss of employees due to COVID-19 and other departmental issues. While we continue the rigorous efforts to hire new staff, we must prepare for the decline in staffing. Contractors, in the event that staffing numbers continue to fall, Solid Waste Services is in contact with contractors who can potentially fill in any gap so the department can continue to provide essential sanitation and environmental services throughout the city. We have an emergency RFP that was sent out on Friday. In addition to the emergency RFP, the department is also working closely with some of our nonprofit partners to help augment our staff that will help the department meet its needs and anticipated seasonal needs in the coming months. Service changes timeline. Due to the spike of COVID-19 cases from Friday and yesterday, and the anticipated cases in the coming weeks based on Super Bowl gatherings, the department felt it was necessary to adjust quicker. Ideally, we would have preferred a much longer leave time to alert our residents of these changes, but the number of COVID-19 cases is dictating our decision-making process while ensuring our employee safety. Beginning the week of Sunday, February 14, 2021, the Department of Public Works Office of Solid Waste Service will begin alternate week collection services for yard trimming and recycling materials. Starting Monday, February 15, 2021, on the second and fourth week of every month, we will collect garbage and recycling materials only. The following week, starting Monday, February 22nd, 2021, on the first and third week of every month, we will collect garbage and yard trimmings only. Please note that Sunday is the date that determines the week. The changes does not affect your normal garbage collection. It only impacts recycling and yard trimming collection days. In the case of a fifth week, garbage collection only. At a minimum, over the next 90 days, these changes will be in effect. A return to our normal recycling and yard cleaning schedule will be made based on the number of COVID-19 cases expected, experienced by the department. We will keep you abreast with a weekly cases to be included with our weekly performance slide that we send City Council. Furthermore, if any other key decisions or changes are made, we will communicate with you in a timely manner. Now, in terms of our communication plan, in order to be successful, the department's communication team has developed a comprehensive communication strategy. The team is also in the process of developing a FAQ document for city council so it can ask questions to its constituents. Other communication plans consider various age demographics to help increase our reach. I will briefly touch on these key touch points. Touch point number one is handheld devices. Social media, say for example, uh, council members Facebook, Twitter, Gram, Instagram, and Next Door. Um, Atlanta Solid Waste mobile app, Recollect, 311 mobile app, and notify ATL text messaging. Second touch point, DPW Solid Waste web page, Recollect, and web portal. City of Atlanta web banner and website homepage. Um, ATL 311 web banner. Emails via uh, constant contact, notify ATL, email messaging, and also um, there's, there's some um, electronic platforms that council members would like to include in newsletters and things of that nature. We can utilize that as well. Our third touch point, robocalls. Our fourth touch point, residential touch points, direct touch points, which are flyers on bins and postcard mail. Um, our uh, next touch point would be our residential touch point with inserting these changes in uh, Department of Watershed bill and, and customer news letter. And then another touch point is through group forum, where the information distributed during NPU meetings beginning in February 2020. Another touch point is potentially the AJC, but that's to be determined. Another touch point is mayor's press briefing. And other touch points that we're also looking at is community affairs and news releases and other items. We talked about communication to our residents. 
We're also focused on increasing our communication with our employees. We have a scheduled mandatory virtual town hall for DPW employees on Thursday, February 11th, starting at 7.15 a.m. We will cover a variety of topics as it relates to COVID-19. In addition to the town hall, we have an opportunity to offer on-site COVID-19 testing to our employees. There are two providers the department is evaluating. Each has different testing offerings and process. We know this is unprecedented time and our staff does not always get the recognition it deserves. We know this is a group of courageous and hardworking employees that are up for this challenge. Selva and Atlanta have shared their stories with DPW leadership team on how our employees show an act of kindness while serving. We just ask that everyone please be patient because COVID-19 is hitting us and realize our employees are in the field every day because of their passion and love for the city of Atlanta. At this time, if you have any questions, I'd like to fill those. All right, uh, thank you. I see Council Member Shepard has a question. Yes. Uh, could you send a document, that document, I don't know if that was the document you was reading from, but you can, get, can you send that out to council members so that we can have that, all council members? Are you going to yes, send that out? Yes, I will send that. Absolutely. Okay. okay, and I think you just asked some of the answers, asked and answered some of the questions I was going to ask in terms of how are we testing our workers. You know, uh, I know there are certain places that when you go in every day before you even walk into the facility, you have to take temperatures. And how are we doing an assessment of our workers to make sure that every day they're being at least the temperature is taken, do some an assessment of them? How are we helping them to help themselves? Can you go into a little more detail? Yeah, absolutely. Every day when an employee is off place enters into one of our installation facilities, they're actually temperature checked as they walk through the actual door. So they're temperature checked and at the same time, they're also supposed to be wearing face covering in terms of their mask as well. So those are the things that we're doing every day. And also we have a, a policy in place as well too, making sure that people have masks. And on our, sol on our, on our fleet services side as well, we've actually posted um, posters as well too, as it relates to no mask, no service. So we're ensuring that anyone that comes in there must also wear a mask. But more importantly, as folks enter different facilities, they are temperature checked. So when you say no mask, no service, that means no mask, no work? Or what does that mean, no mask? No, no mask, service? no service, that's on, that's on the fleet services side. So say, for example, if I'm the fire department and I want to bring in my vehicle for servicing, if the person that's bringing in the vehicle, we won't service the vehicle unless they have a mask. And we're also notifying people as well as when they bring a vehicle in for servicing and fleet services, we're also sanitizing the vehicle and letting that sit for two hours before the actual technician works on that actual vehicle itself. Mm -hmm. So what is, if there was a breakdown of where we're having the most fight in COVID-19, is it in fleet services? Is it in our workers on the street? Where is our spike in your department? Where are we seeing the biggest spike? Apparently, it sounds like uh, trash pickup and things like that. Where is the spike the most? The, the, large, the biggest spike is in our solid waste services. That's where we have our largest spike. Okay. By far. Now, let me ask, do the people who are our workers, are they uh, are required to wear masks out on the street when they're picking up trash also? They're supposed to be wearing their masks while they're out in the street. And we've been reinforcing that policy. So are, are they following through? Are, are the workers actually following all of those things that y'all are asking for? My gut feeling probably tells me some of them probably aren't since we're not out there with them on a regular basis on the vehicle, but that is something that has been communicated to the supervisors, the drivers of the trucks, and in cases where we see folks aren't wearing masks, we would really appreciate if someone would actually um, let us know or notify us because we would like to have those discussions with that actual crew if they're out there not wearing masks. One of the things I've always shared with the supervisors is on a daily basis, my number one concern and number one goal is making sure everyone goes home healthy to their families and they don't bring COVID-19 you know, into their home. Okay. And I guess an uh, overall question, not for you, but are we having this problem in other departments without essential workers out across, or is it just the Department of Public Works where we seem to be having the largest spike of problems? 
Do you know or can somebody answer that? Are we having that problem with water set? Are we having that problem with the police department? Are we having this problem in code enforcement? I'm just trying to understand what is happening specifically around public works. And I'm not trying to pick, pick you all out, but I just want to know if we do analysis, is this one of the biggest problems in this department? You know, Ms. Shepard, I think that's a great thing for a finance exec to take on. And I know in the report from uh, Commissioner Browning, she mentioned something like 93 uh, COVID cases as of mid-January or something. So if you want a citywide dive, that would be something we could do probably HR, I would think. But I didn't mean to cut you off, Mr. Robinson. Go ahead. No, no, okay. that's fine. I was gonna... No, I'm fine. Okay. Well, I mean, it's very important for our employees that we protect them and if we need to figure out what we need to do to make that happen and to do some regiment stuff to make sure that they follow the rules and make sure that they're not sick and that, you know, we don't have employees who are really in bad situations. And so I'm just trying to figure out what we can do to help support this. And in addition to making sure we have the services we need to pick up our trash every day, but also mm -hmm. it's important in terms of the employees themselves making sure what we can do to help them to understand what needs to happen and what we can do as a city to make sure we're providing what we need for very essential workers. But thank you for the information. But can you send us a copy of that report? And thank you, Ms. Archibald. That's a good question. I think we need to look at this as a city as a whole to be looking at what are we doing. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, yeah. Council Member Shepard. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Council Member Shepard. And the question that I asked uh, Commissioner Browning about the joint study they're doing with Georgia Tech about fecal matter. I was talking to Mr. Robinson about do we know that as our workers are standing outside of the trucks as the items are being crushed and compressed and pushed back, what kind of fumes and, and what's being inhaled and maybe everybody needs an N95. I mean, we don't know all of the causes of COVID-19 and how it's spread. And so if we don't know, then that means we take extra precautions. So I don't know if that's something that could be added to the Georgia Tech uh, analysis, adding public work, but we um, really need to get to the bottom of that. So thank you for uh, asking those questions. And the other question that I asked uh, Mr. Robinson, and I don't believe you mentioned it, and that is as we look at the alternating week for picking up yard trimmings and yard debris, uh, I understand you're going to relax or eliminate the uh, threshold for triggering bulk rubbish. They're going to pick up every other week whatever's on the curb. Would you go over that a little bit, please? Yes, absolutely. They're going to pick up everything that is definitely, in, as it relates, in the actual bags. The um, bags that they set up will be picked up on the curb. So we're definitely going to be picking that up. Okay. And so... Um, the, but, there will be, yeah, but there will be some bulk items that can still be scheduled because obviously, say for example, if someone's cutting down large tree branches that would qualify as that real big bulk pickup, we can still schedule those as well too. But those those can still be scheduled. Well, in the communication, and I understand, uh, in the communication that you're going to be push, pushing out, I think it's going to be really important to lay out the rules of engagement, particularly if we're changing the schedule and we're relaxing the restrictions on the number of bags that can be picked up and in your um, reporting back or, or sharing information with the public do you have any idea uh, how long this temporary change in schedule is anticipated to last yes so we anticipate a minimum of 90 days on this schedule but if we're able to reach a threshold of 75% attendance rate over a period of time, then we'll be able to go back to normal operations. So what we want to do is make sure that when we hit this threshold, that our COVID numbers are, are either stabilizing or they're not, you know, they're not in flux. So that's what will be the determining factor how we go back to um, normal operations. Okay. And uh, members who are the essential workers, and especially the crews that are on the backs of these trucks, they are still getting the hazard pay, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And if 
if a worker is out with COVID, what happens to, to the entitlement to that comp extra compensation? If the worker's out for COVID, um, hold on, let me just check my notes here. I hope there's if no I'm, penalty. Yeah, no, there's, there's, no, there's no penalty for a worker being out on, uh, on, on COVID. Okay, all right. Thank you. No, 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 absolutely no, absolutely not. Okay, so you want to start this uh, temporary change in scheduling of recycling and yard trimmings effective Monday. Yeah, that's correct. And so we can expect to have the information that Ms. Shepard has requested and uh, what you're going to be pushing out. Can we get that in advance because we may have some uh, information or different ways to say it or we could be helpful in how you frame uh, some of the comments as we have experiences in pushing out information to the public. So when will you be able to share your communication um, plan with us? Not just the plan, but actually the information you're going to be pushing out. Will you be able to share that with us in advance or is that still under development? That's still under development, but I'll definitely push out the document that we have today to the council and as we develop these uh the different communication i will definitely share that with you as well too okay and you mentioned that you would put it in the uh water bill what's the cycle on a water bill i know they get to the go ahead yeah yeah we missed this cycle but they'll definitely be in the next cycle of water bills absolutely that's where we'll actually include those all right thanks all right thank you so much colleagues any other questions Sure. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, as regards to the workers, um, is there anything the city can reasonably do to um, help those infected? Hmm. That's that's a good question. Um, let, let me sit down and, and sit down with HR and think through that one a little bit and see what we can do. Because if I look at through the numbers and information that I have present here, hold on. Yeah, let me let me dig into that one a little. That's a good question. I'd like to dig into that a little bit because if we look at it, since we've been tracking the numbers, I mean we've had a total of 86 total cases since last year, and 60 of those employees have returned back to work. But let me see for the twin six that are out. Let, let me think through that one. All right. And then I hate to ask this, but I guess it has to be asked. If, as a matter of a fee for service, the city charges X, but the services huh. delivered are X minus two. And it's a law department question. What kind of legal jeopardy might we be in in terms of people challenging their fees? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, one of the, the, the um, protections that we do have, our costs have actually risen. I mean, obviously, the increased cost of our PPP and PPE and sanitation, the ability to sanitize Mr. our... Mr. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Robinson, this is yes. Nina Hicks from the legal department. I'd ask I'm you sorry. to um, defer, please. At this, I'm point, sorry. at this point, council member, we... Uh, have not had the opportunity to run that analysis so if you would give us an opportunity we were just informed um about the intent to read this announcement and so we need the opportunity to review it to provide you uh an answer and it may be provided in executive session but if you'll please allow us that opportunity i would appreciate it well all right because boy uh, <laughs> District members, get ready. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well, Mr. Shep, I want to um, get Mr. Robinson to respond to something he said uh, to me, and that is that anyone who is a what they maybe label a super recycler, the, the department has the capacity to distribute additional cans so that if the alternating week creates a burden for them, that they can request a duplicate or or second recycling can and i guess it would be the yard trimming piece that would be um challenging if it's a rainy event and the bags start disintegrating 
Um, so, Ms. Robinson, can you speak to that? And also something that we've talked about a lot, and that is if you know as a department that bags may be subject to disintegration, would love to see if there were shovels and brooms and some additional effort made to pick up the remnants of bags and not just go through the motions. And I know we've talked about this, so you know what I mean. So can you speak mm -hmm. to additional cans as well as the extra effort that will be made to make sure we actually pick up all of the yard trimmings? Uh, it's a great question. So absolutely, um, we will make available, for especially for some of the super recyclers, that we will make, um, you know, extra bins available to them at no cost. So we'll definitely, you know, provide the extra bins for the super recyclers. Now, in terms of the um, yard collection and yard debris, one of the things that we have done is instruct our supervisors and our team members who are out in the field to really make sure not only are they just picking up the bag, but they're also picking up the debris that's left behind in the bag as well, too. So in terms of that, that's been communicated with the team. Um, so what we do is we do have daily update meetings with our uh, management team in solid waste to evaluate you know, what are some of the challenges that they're faced with? And in addition, myself, I'm actually out there riding on the weekends sometimes or just riding during the day as well, too, just to ensure that, hey, we're cleaning up what we're supposed to be cleaning up. And I think the extra eyes that are out there also are kind of our workers are beginning, you know, they're putting in some of the extra effort as well, too. So they're not going through the motion. So we kind of really level set the expectation with our solid waste workers on what's really expected of them when they do pick up yard debris and yard trimmings. Hmm. Okay. Well, well and, and, um, but one more, one more right. question. Um, I, um, is there anyone on this call who's consulted as to the wisdom of inviting visitors here for an NBA All-Star game? I don't recall that coming to council. And in light of this, I, uh, I have to really wonder about the wisdom of it. Should we tell them to pack out their own trash? Excuse me, can you repeat the question again? Was it about the wisdom of the NBA All-Star game? Yeah, is there anyone on this call who's consulted about the wisdom of hosting an NBA All-Star game and all the visitors that implies, especially now in the middle of the discussion we're currently having? Thank you. Uh, Howard, let's take that back up again at Finance Exec um, to see if anyone has any wisdom to share on that. So, uh, yeah, colleagues, any uh, other uh, questions? All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robinson. We look forward to receiving the information that you uh, have promised to provide and to continuing to hear from you with some regularity on uh, the status of the staffing and any changes in moving us back to our regular collecting schedules. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other uh, comments or um things that we need to um, consider as a committee. If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, thank you. All right. I second that. Uh, without objection, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Very good meeting.